All right, sir, so let's get underway. Thanks everyone for joining us this evening. My name is Rich Groves. Uh, I'm the VP of Professional Affairs here for the next DDS. And it's my pleasure to be your host and your moderator for this evening. We've got a great agenda lined up for you, courtesy of our guest and our speaker for this evening, Dr. Cody Muggleston. Hi, Dr. Muggleston. This is part three in a three-part series. So if you have uh, had the pleasure of hearing Dr. Bianca Vallejo and Dr. Janky Patel in recent weeks, uh, thanks for joining us for a third session. And if you haven't, be sure to check out their archives viewing. Uh, really, really great presentations that will be culminated here with Dr. Muggleston's presentation tonight on mentorship, leadership, and confidence. Uh, this is sponsored in part by Pacific Dental Services, so we thank them for making us uh, able to bring this great program to you this evening. We're going to go for about 45 minutes and allow Dr. Muggleston to share some of his experience in these important topics for you. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A session at the very end of tonight's scenario so that you can hold your questions or share them in the chat and in the Q&A functions in your screens right now. We're going to queue as many of those as we have time for at the end of the session and allow Dr. Muggleston to share his thoughts on any of the questions you might have. And in the meantime, if you would just advance to that next screen, Dr. Muggleston. Uh, I'd love for you to stick around toward the very end of our presentation. I'm going to pose a, a survey for you. We're interested in knowing how we can improve our webinar series for you in future days. And so if you would be so kind as to hit that survey and share your thoughts, you'll be eligible to win a free iPad that we'll draw at random from our, our guests this evening and uh, a token of our appreciation for your feedback. And so without any further ado, it's my real pleasure to introduce you to our speaker this evening, Dr. Cody Muggleston. Cody? Hi, guys. Um, very nice to meet you all. Um, as Rich said, I'm Dr. Muggleston. Um, I am uh, going to talk to you guys a little bit today about um, three key topics, uh, mentorship, leadership, and um, also going over kind of how we are going to practice with confidence. And, and, and this is really going to be important for not only um, the future of your practice and opening up a business, um, but also, you know, if you decide to specialize or you're deciding to do a GPR or in general creating great relationships with your teams and developing the proper teams. Um, we're going to go over these five main topics today um, on mentors and, and how, you, um, how you engage them. Uh, also developing leadership skills, building relationships and trust, uh, both with your patients and with your staff. We're going to go over practicing with confidence and pursuing clinical excellence. Um, so to start us off, I'll switch over here, uh, a little bit about myself. So as Rich said, I'm, uh, I'm actually out in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, my, my story kind of began uh, back in undergraduate at University of Arizona. I graduated high school at 16 years old and went on to um, start my undergraduate program uh, U of A, and I, I really had a, an original focus on biology and moved to psychology eventually because I really wanted to focus on studying how to work with people. Um, I, I, I knew that my, you know, a job in healthcare is going to be all about patient care, so I really wanted to know how to um, and listen to my patients properly and be able to support them both mentally and, um, and physically. Uh, it, in addition, I learned a lot about people skills that really related to uh, my, my, my long-term plans as a, as a business owner. So I really got to learn a lot of great communication styles and, and personality styles and personality profiling that helps uh, long-term. Um, I then went to dental school at UNLV. Uh, the whole reason why I decided to go into dental is because of a, I, I have horrible teeth. Um, when I was younger, I got made fun of a lot. Uh, I had a really big overbite, I you know, have a big buck teeth out there, and, and when I met an orthodontist, he changed my life. And from there, I said to myself, you know what, I, I, I want to do that for other people, um, and, and I want to get involved with this, and I, I really think dental is the way to go. So off I went to dental school and graduated uh, UNLV at two, in 2011. So I've been practicing for almost six years, um, and now... I decided out of school to actually join with Pacific Dental Services, which we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about uh, at some point, kind of my journey with them a little bit later. Um, but 
Uh, now I currently, uh, you, 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 if you guys were here last week, you had the privilege of getting to meet uh, who, uh, a previous associate that is now my partner, Dr. Belayo, uh, Bianca Belayo, and, uh, and so we opened up a new practice for her this last year, and, um, and she had a lot of great things to say, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, now I uh, own multiple practices in both Nevada, um, I'm sorry, Nevada, Texas, and Virginia. And so uh, my story is quite unique, but I, I really fell in love with this organization. They really taught me a lot of valuable skills that allowed me to be a business owner and, and kind of an entrepreneurial type. Um, and so that's, that's kind of my backstory. I have a daughter, um, also Madison, and a wife, Jessica, that I've been with since I was 15. So um, they, they are... Uh, they are my, my world, and, and I, I apologize today if I'm a little bit uh, cloudy. Uh, I just found out this morning that um, we're having a second baby girl, so I'm really excited and kind of jacked up about <laughs> That's that. That's great. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm Congratulations so from us all, Dr. Muggleston. Thanks, man. Thanks. So, um, so let's get to it, guys. Um, the start of this is really um, – important to re recognize that it's, it's never too early to have a game plan, guys. It's not. Uh, I spoke this morning at UNLV and I was talking to a lot of the students uh, during the lunch and learn about, you know, don't forget that dental school is a stepping stone. Uh, it, it's just a small blip in the radar of your, of your long-term career. And you want to make sure that you're looking at it that way. You know, with all the stress and pathology tests and all the things that you're, you're worked up about and boards and it's, it's just all of this is just, ah, uh, it feels like it's closing in. Remember, it, it gets better. You'll get through it. And at the end, you, you have to have an end game. Where are you going? Where's your career going? Um, and, and so my recommendation is to start creating intentionality for how you're going to move forward and where you plan on going. Um, consider mentors. That's probably one of the biggest things I can tell you. Um, mentors will help really shape the focus and attention um, of your ideas and, and help you along your pathway. And they'll give you the support you need uh, at times when sometimes you don't even know you need it. Um, you want to be a sponge as an associate. Uh, you know, always, I, I tell people all the time, I look for three main things when I'm looking to hire. It's I want them to be humble, I want them to be hungry, and I want them to be coachable. If they have those things, they're a great opportunity for an associate in my practice. Um, and so you want to be sure that you take everything in and be vulnerable enough with your, your owner doctor or, or those around you that can help support you, even assistance. You know, you don't know um, much coming out of school. You think you do. But a lot, of the, a lot of the assistants know more than you. have been doing it for 10 to 15 years and can teach you a lot of great, honestly, clinical skills and technical skills and, and patient management skills that will really grow uh, into something special. Um, you want to maximize your opportunities, be intentional. Um, and, and these three ways are really how to do that. Build clinical skills and manual dexterity. Um, learn about different practice settings, how how to be efficient, and then experience real practice environments. Go out there and, and meet a doctor that's doing it really well and see what they're doing that you didn't think of and, and, and get those experiences to see how to be more efficient. Um, this, this is a picture of me the first day I ever practiced uh, with a license. So I was young and very, very scared. That smile is a complete lie. I was freaked out, um, but... Uh, it was a great experience, and it's been a, a fun ride. Um, recommendations for mentors. I, I, I want to skip to number five on this because that's really the key. It's organic. It needs to be an organic process. Um, mentors, yeah, you want to find the, the right person for you. They fit with you. You want to study this person. You want to know what makes them tick and what their passion is with dentistry and how they can help you get there to your end game faster. Um, if, if they prep, you know, if you get, you think they're the right person, you start to realize that they don't see eye to eye with the type of dentistry you want to do, or, you know, you, you may not even see eye to eye with their personal life or some things that they choose to do outside of, of dentistry, perhaps that's not the right fit for you. Um, but when you find that one that you really connect with and you really know it's a good choice, you know, really start to have those 
crucial conversations around, hey, you know, I really want to learn from you. you you're doing the things that I want to do. Um, are you open to, uh, you know, letting me watch you and, and call you and ask questions and, and maybe go to dinner once in a while and, and, and pick your brain and, and kind of work your way into that relationship. But really, it's about building trust with one another. Um, and over time, it will become more o very organic. Um, I had one uh, a dental student at UNLV ask me, you know, how do I go up and ask them, hey, do you want to be my mentor? Well, well, no, you, I mean, you, you could, but it's probably going to be a little awkward. Um, so maybe just kind of work into, hey, you know, I really respect the dentistry you do. You have a really great mindset uh, for how to do business. And I'm, I'm really, I, I look up to that, and I'd really like to learn from you over the years and have open communication. Are you okay with that? You know, and, and kind of start to create that relationship. Um, don't wait for your mentor necessarily to start. The relationship, you be the, you be the person that's the conduit of that, the catalyst, the one that gets it going, um, starts the relationship, brings out um, the, the, the focus on building that trust between one another. Um, definitely, you want to always ask for feedback. Um, learn what, what you're doing that may be different than how they would do it or ask them their approach. And lastly, be all in. You know, if, you're, if you really, really want to make it a, a great mentor-mentee relationship, you definitely want to give them all you got. If, if you tell them, hey, you know, please tell me how I can be better. I want to learn. And then you're like, yeah, yeah, I already tried that. You know, no, that doesn't work for me. I mean, if you start shutting it down and you don't listen and be vulnerable to their, their um, you know, recommendations, it, it could really make that relationship difficult. Defining your vision. Uh, you know, when you start to make this transition into practicing, uh, you want to think of these key questions and ask yourself this, you know, what kind of dentist do you want to be? Uh, do you want to be that guy that just, I just want to do huge cosmetic cases, see four patients a day, and I'm going to make that work? Or do you see yourself as a, as a, as a teacher, an educator, and you want to go into a pathway of education into a dental school or a dental institute? Um, you know, those are all things that you want to find out what kind of guy you want to be, what kind of girl you want to be and grow into what type of dentist. Um, do you, you know, what's your idea of the perfect practice? I only want to work four days a week. You know, uh, you know, if that's your, your case, okay, then, then, then create a, a practice around that. Um, that's not my style. I like to, I like to work and go and, and I'm very, um, I, I like to see big picture and I like to grow, 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 and I'm very driven. So, my offices, I try to push the same way. We, we work a lot of days and we open up on Saturdays and we work extended hours and we want to be there and support our patients any time of the day, any hour that we can, no matter what that means. Uh, how do you want your team to work? Do you want them to be, you know, if you're way or the highway and you have a bunch of people that kind of follow your lead or do you want to be that synergy type person that really, hey guys, uh, you know, I. I really want your input on this. What do you think about this? How do we get better? Do you guys like what I'm doing over here? What's your thought process on how we can grow? Or do you have a marketing plan to, to create more new patients? You know, ask your team and involve them. That, that could be really beneficial. So, you know, you really want to dive into that. And then how do you want your patients to feel about your team, your practice, maybe just you in general, individually as the doctor? Um, I'm really, I'm really passionate about having my office be, you know, always available to emergencies. If somebody calls in and says they have, they have an emergency, gosh darn it, I'm getting them in that day. It doesn't matter what our schedule looks like, I will fit them in or stay late for them. Uh, I really like technology. I use a syrup machine in my practice, um, in all of my practices. Um, we, we're at, doing the addition of the CVCT. I love doing implants. I do a lot of implants. Um, I want my patients to feel like I can do every procedure and have those things. Um, and, and that's really creates a great vibe with my, um, with my community. They know where I'm at. I'm very visible. It's in a very, very prominent area where everyone can see it. So people know I'm there and know I'm there to help. And I like that reputation we built. So, you know, think about what you want patients to say about you. Compatibility. Um, you know, as you start to grow and look into your, your first opportunity to be a, a, an associate, 
there's a lot of things that I see in interviews. Um, I, I've, I've heard it all, seen it all, good, bad, and different. Some ones that really knocked it out of the park and they were terrible, um, you know, really not good at doing their job or executing the way that they had said they could when they came, when they actually showed up to work. Um, and and, and it, it's, it's, it's hard to be able to balance that and figure out what's the right fit. As an associate, when you come in, it's okay to start asking really, really in-depth questions because you, as much of it as it's an interview for an owner, it's equally an interview for you guys as associates, right? Um, you want to be really comfortable with the opportunity you're going into. You want to make sure that you, you, you know the doctor, that your philosophies align, um, that, that you're going to be working the hours you feel are, are necessary or, or, or viable for your own mental health, right? You don't want to be working seven days, 10 hours a day and never seeing your family. I mean, that's, that's just not feasible. So you really want to ask good questions. Uh, we narrowed this down to the top three questions, though, that I think I, I, I would expect every uh, associate to ask when they come in for an interview of me as the doctor. So um, if they don't ask these questions, I'm a little concerned that maybe they're not prepared or ready. So the three questions I have is, you know, what character traits are most important to you in an associate? So I have my associate sitting across from me, this potential new associate, asking me this in the interview. So I usually give an opportunity to say, hey, do you have any questions for me? And I want, I want them to ask, you know, what, do you, what, are your, you know, what are your expectations of me as your associate? That's great. It's a great question. Uh, opens up great dialogue. We can talk about what our values are. It's awesome. What are you looking for in your next associate that was missing from your previous? You know, why did your previous doctor leave? Uh, that's a good one. Uh, you may get a lot of information from that. Maybe you see the doctor squirm a little bit, and maybe that's a red flag, or perhaps they're like, no, I can tell you exactly what happened, X, Y, Z, and these things are concerns for me, and this can't happen in my practice. So now you learn what their ethical values are. So ask those questions. Ask those questions. Lastly, what job-related situations have you found the most challenging to your associates? So what have your associates struggled with in your practice before me? Uh, and, and how did they, how did you guys over, uh, uh, how did you combat those problems and overcome them? Uh, a big one that's, that's not on here that I think is very fair, and I'm just going to dive in real quick, but I don't know what you guys think, but I want you to ask me if you're an associate or I asked when I was an associate, how much money am I going to make? You know, that's okay. Um, you know, you have people that really want to tiptoe around that question. They get leery around the, 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 the compensation packages. This is business. This is okay. This is going to be my job. It's going to provide for my family. I want to know what I'm going to make and how I can grow. And is there an opportunity to grow even further beyond the compensation package given? Is there some um, incentive? things that really get me going that, that will push me to want to drive harder. And if I do give you maximum effort, will I get that something back in return? So leadership, guys. So now you've landed your first job. You get that job you wanted. You're super excited and jacked about it. Um, and now it's time to come in and do dentistry. But wait a second. You know, what you don't realize is that the second you walk into that building, and you have a DMD or DDS, you have your degree, you're walking in as the doctor, suddenly everyone starts to look at you as a leader in the practice. And that's something I don't think we, we quite understand until it hits you smack in the face and the real world wakes you up. And to be honest with you, when I, was, um, when I came out, you know, I didn't realize that as much until that first week I started working. And staff are coming up asking me questions. Stop, what do you want to do here? Hey, what do you think about this? Hey, should you, should, you know, do you like the x-rays or do you want to see something else? Or, you know, hey, I just don't know what I'm going to do with this. Can you help me? Suddenly, everyone's coming at me. And I realize, I don't know half the questions they're asking me. Well, I'm going to try and figure it out. And so over time, you realize that you really have to come in and be a leader. And no one really teaches you how to be a leader. Um, and so, you know, I encourage a lot of different things, reading book, leadership books and mentors and, and, and starting to get your feet wet a little bit. We're trying new things safely. Um, but, you know, you're a leader for a lot of different things. You're a leader for your patients. 
Uh, you're there to execute your treatment plans and lead them and guide them into better uh, oral health. Um, to help support the practice reputation. And all of these things end up contributing to the business and how successful it is. And you don't realize it, but an associate is absolutely crucial to all of these different types of success that you see here listed. Um, and, and without a really engaged um, leader type associate, some of these can really suffer. Um, my practice. So leadership in my practice is very, very important. It's very unique. We have a different approach. Um, and one of the biggest things in my practice philosophy is I actually joined Pacific Dental for the reason. I, I, I saw a lot of DSOs. I, I did a lot of research. I called people that joined every DSO, uh, that left all these DSOs. I came down to three that I was really interested in. And PDS by far, Pacific Dental stood way, way, way far above the rest for my personal values. And I, just as a side note, guys, I do a lot of these speaking engagements all over, and I'm telling you, um, as far as it goes, what works for me may not be for you. And that's okay. That's not what I'm here for. I just want you to understand that there are great DSOs out there. There are some that are, you know, more coin corporate, right? And so, um, but a lot of the reasons why things don't fit have less to do with the organization and more to do with the fact that the person didn't ask the right questions like we talked about earlier. You know, and you'll see some of the same struggles you get in maybe one of these situations in maybe a, a supported, a dental supported practice or um, even a private practice. The struggles are no different. So whether you relate to the practice philosophy or not is independent of any company. When I look at a DSO though, when I was doing my research, my thought was if there's one out there that aligns with my ethical philosophy and what are my goals were, at the end of the day, I would join with them because I know nothing about business. So in came Pacific Dental in my life um, and it's been, it's, it's been a huge blessing for my wife and my family and myself and my own mental uh, uh, capacity and autonomy as a practicing uh, dentist. Um, what they have done for me is I truly, my passion was I wanted to teach. Um, and that's a very uh, difficult pathway. Typically, it's limited to going to a dental school and teaching. But what Pacific Dental offered me was an opportunity to, hey, you can be a great leader and teacher and speaker. But what you can do is be a practice owner at the same time and use your abilities to coach and teach new, younger associates how to do it well and be successful and buy practices with them and help their growth and help the businesses grow. And so that's kind of how I've leveraged this particular model, and I love it. Uh, I, I'm able to do this with you guys. It was at UNLV earlier today, and I still practice a lot um, and focus on implant dentistry, which I love to do. That's my passion. So. Um, this has kind of been my experience. So my practice philosophy in that environment is very much, hey, we're here to support the doctors and we're here to teach the doctors and build great owner partners. All right, folks, this is Rich Groves. I just want to break in and give Dr. Muggleston a quick moment to catch a, a glass of water if need be. We'd like to open a quick poll for you while we're talking about some of your aspirations and some of the things you're considering after your time in school. I want to open a poll just so you have a chance to share that feedback and explain what you're thinking about as far as your next step is concerned. Just take a quick moment and share your thoughts. We'll be back to Dr. Muggleston in just a moment. All right, answers coming in now. Excellent, excellent. Okay, just a couple more stragglers. Thanks for your thoughts, folks. We appreciate your consideration and thanks for joining us this evening. We really appreciate it. Let that poll run for just a moment more. We've got about 15 seconds to go, folks, if you want to share your feedback, and then we'll be back to Dr. Muggleston.
Okay. And here we are. Okay, Dr. Muggleston, thanks so much. Back to you, sir. Thank you. So, you know, the, the real key and the real fundamental core to really being the provider of choice and being the leader of a practice and being the guy that, that your teams want to be around or the girl that, that your teams want to be around and, and the one that, that you can really become a mentor for others um, and being able to support your, your office staff in such a way that they feel like they're being listened to and heard is to really build trust with them. Uh, unless you have built trust, um, you are losing. Um, trust, we, we, we talk about this a lot in a lot of speaking engagement, uh, engagements that trust fuels, in, it, it fuels investment and over time investment creates loyalty and, and, and belief in, in your vision. Um, the main ways you can create this kind of trust and build these relationships is by, um, the hands down, the number one reason is communication. Without proper communication, even difficult communication where you have to have very crucial conversations that are difficult to have at times, um, if you cannot communicate your thoughts, ideas, desires, uh, disagreements, um, you're losing and you will lose. And I would say probably the vast majority of every major issue I may have come across in my practices stems from a communication error or a communication glitch. Um, so if you can really get down very open and, and professional and healthy communication, not only so that your staff can feel like they can talk to you and your, your teams, but also so that you can be yourself and, and give your thought process out openly to where if you don't like something, you're okay with saying it instead of, you know, keeping that in, uh, you know, it, it, will, it will really help the synergy in a practice. Active listening, showing appreciation. We're going to go through some of these but um, a little later, but showing appreciation, delegating responsibility, ownership and establishing group pride. These are all very, very key things that will help your leadership skills. The daily huddle. This is, uh, you know, every morning we do a team huddle. It's extremely important. Um, the nice thing about that that I've seen out of the daily huddle is it does create a very, very tight-knit group. Uh, everyone's kind of on the same page. You can review the patients and the daily schedule, reflecting on the, day, on, on, on the days and previous days' successes. Um, also, challenges that we had. Hey, there was a patient complaint. We want to get this right. Um, you get feedback from your team. Hey, you know, Dr. Mogelson, we really feel like you weren't, you weren't, moving fast enough for us and it put us behind 30 minutes and now patients were a little upset and we had to do X, Y, Z and work harder to be able to support your lack of speed or, 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 you, or you know, Dr. Mogelson, you didn't really listen to us uh, when we were talking to you about this, this particular case and you kind of did it your way and, it, and this is the problem that we're seeing with it now. So, you know, if, if we're not open to these kind of this opportunity for feedback from our team, it can, it can make it difficult. So I try to use the daily huddle for those things as well. Um, and then also troubleshooting, resetting, you know, getting back to the core of what makes the practice um, doing well. I, I recommend lengthwise no more than 15 minutes. If you're going past 15 minutes, maybe it should be a scheduled one hour uh, office meeting. I'll usually bring them, we'll come in an hour early and do, do breakfast. We'll bring breakfast items and everybody kind of hangs out and we go through some dive in deeper if we need to. Um, and the format is a lot of uh, standing room only, right? I like to have everybody to where they're standing in a close proximity so they're all really engaged and everybody gets to give a little bit of the feedback. Um, active listening, uh, this is a, a really great psych psychology skill that's used almost across the board. Um, but basically if somebody gives you information, you repeat that information back with your understanding and make sure that you're on the same page. Uh, so for instance, um, you know, hey, Dr. Muggleston, I'm coming in today um, uh, to 
talk to you because I'm very upset about the way my manager, um, um, uh, the manager was speaking to me, um, and this is coming from one of my benefits coordinators. And the manager really wasn't listening to me, and I'm very concerned with this. I want, I want to have a conversation with you about how I can relate to our manager a little better. You know, I just feel like he's not listening. Okay, uh, so, you know, I'm Dr. Mogson now talking. Hey, Sarah, you know, what I hear you saying is that there's a communication error between you and Josh. And, 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 and tell me, um, you know, it, is that something that, is it really bothersome to you? And are you facing some challenges? And, and am, I, am I hearing you right that you just, you're feeling it's a lack of communication or is it a lack of understanding of what your desires are? So really kind of diving in and double clicking on each one of those points that they're trying to make so they know, I hear you, I'm engaging you, I want open communication, open lines, uh, open-ended questions, I want to hear more from you. And it really does work well and calm people down and kind of get a real good comfort, comfortable flow going. Um, this is a, a great quote here, but the, the, the idea is that people crave appreciation, especially your staff. Um, it, there's a book that I'm going to recommend, and there's a couple books that I, that I recommend to almost every one of my partners and associates, um, and we'll have that list at the end. But um, one of those books is The Five Love Languages. Uh, it's a great book, and it's all about proper communication and, and how people like to receive um, um, information and how they like to be received to build great relationships. And one of those is um, acts of kindness or, or, or sh you know, showing a pre uh, uh, words of affirmation, giving, giving some sort of appreciation to the person for the job that they've done, big or small. And uh, it can be in the smallest ways by just walking out the door at the end and saying, you know what, guys, it was a really difficult day, but, man, you guys killed it today. And I, I know we were stressed and we got shorter lunches and that one patient walked in and wanted to do everything. We stayed two hours late, but think about what we did and how hard you worked. Think about what it did to change that patient's life. And I, I can't thank you guys enough for being the team you are. And sometimes just saying it is everything to them. They, they don't need anything else. Sometimes they're like, you know, yeah, you're right. And they walk home and they come in ready to fire it up the next morning. Uh, for me personally, every year I take my staff out to a really, really nice trip. Uh, the past couple of years I've taken them to Mexico on a cruise. And I take the entire team. And it's a big office. We have pediatrics, orthodontics, periodontists, endodontists, dental anesthesiologists, um, and uh, an oral surgeon, and it's and multiple doctors, multiple um, hygienists, um, and, and so to take that many people, it's a big in endeavor. But you know what? It's worth it for them, and and I want them to know how much I appreciate their hard work. And in the end, they all come back just saying how thankful they are that they work with a group that really supports them, their growth, and, and treats them like people that, that they pr are, are appreciated in the practice. Um, so, so think about that as you're going through and what kind of incentives you can do to show them and do it out of pocket. What can you do to show them, hey, you're valuable? Um, you know, here's some things to consider. You know, do you, do you recognize, you know, each individual achievement? Are you going to talk to them as a team, publicly, privately, um, celebrate team wins as a group? And, you know, you know, when to reward or just give accolades. If you're constantly giving them things all the time, that's a problem. You're going to start to expect it. It's going to kind of go to the point where they don't appreciate it anymore. Um, so, you know, balance it out. Balanced out, definitely find what the, the, the right, you know, niche is there. Interactive staff meetings. I said, you know, there are times when we need to kind of pull away and do something a little bit bigger. And in these situations, usually there's big, big topics. You know, what's our mission statement? How are we being, uh, how can we better coach? Uh, what We're having trust issues, or maybe we're just not, the, the whole team isn't around the, the strategy for um, how we're going to grow and what the vision of the practice is. So we have to realign at times. Um, and it's really, really key to make sure that you're not always the one doing it and leading it. You'll find that you can empower a lot of people in your practice by allowing some of them to take the lead and run the meeting. And I do that often. I, I very rarely run the meeting myself. A lot of times what I do is I have my associates run 
And so now they're getting the practice of learning how to be a leader in a, in a business that's not theirs that they own. So that in the future, when they're ready to partner and they say they want to partner with me in a practice, they've had the experience of running a, 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 be, a business meeting, a good conversation. They, they, they understand how to do it, and they feel more comfortable when it's their turn to do it in their own practice. Um, set a time limit. You know, make it finite. End it on time. People will appreciate that. Don't go too long. If you're a little bit short, that's okay, um, but just make sure it's set. Um, standing room only is honestly I feel with that one it just honestly depends on the situation if I want it to be a more intimate conversation and a quicker conversation we'll stay closer we'll knock it out we'll get we'll, you know we'll just we'll be really interactive and we'll move forward but if it's a longer meeting maybe you do sit down and hash some things out um, encourage all your team members to be a part of it though nobody nobody's voice should not be heard even a dental assistant who may be, may be on your scale, maybe one of your lowest paid and maybe the, in, in your mind might have the lowest role per se. Um, it's not that way. They, they're equally important and perhaps have eyes and hear things that you will never. And they're a great tool to teach you things that you're not seeing in your business. Accountability and responsibility. These two things are extremely um, different, um, though they relate. Uh, responsibility is, you know, what's your duty? What, what is your role in the practice? And accountability is being liable for when, you know, things go wrong. Um, so, you know, holding accountability is extremely important. Having everyone know their role and their responsibilities is also. So until everyone has a good idea of what the, those responsibilities are, it's very hard to hold them accountable. So make sure that you line that up when they first come in. Hey, you know, you're my benefits coordinator. Your job is to create care slips and line up insurances and, and make sure that patients understand their, uh, their choices financially. And when that goes wrong or the communication is missed and the patient says, yeah, I, I, didn't, I, I don't even know if I can do this. You know, they said there's some ways we can make it affordable, but they, they didn't really give me options. Okay, I go back to my benefits coordinator. We have to have a conversation. Your whole role is to help the patient and be a be a support for them to understand how we can get the dentistry done that they want. So let's go back in and try and maybe I need to teach you some things you didn't see before. So holding your team accountable is very, very, very crucial. Um, group pride, I, this, I mean, this comes over time, I think, and it really speaks to the vision of the practice and what your mission statement is about how you're going forward and, and the way your team feels. But you know, I want my team to feel like it's their office, that this is their prideful and their practice, where they work, that it's a living, breathing business, and they are a huge part of it. They're a conduit for the energy that, that comes out of it. Um, they show pride in the building, the walls. They keep the floors clean, enthusiasm for the patients and the practice, and then refer to the patients as, as our patients that we're serving. Rich, I think you got a poll now, man. All right. Thanks very much, Dr. Muggleston. We are going to set up our second poll for the evening, folks, if you wouldn't mind just to, I'm going to open this quick one for you and interested in your feedback on some of the things that matter about the way you're considering your future practice and, and how you'll look to enter the profession. And if you wouldn't mind sharing your thoughts, we'd love to hear how you rate your level of interest and your feedback here on what's important to you as an associate. Nice and easy. Thanks everyone for your candid thoughts. I'll leave the poll open just a few more moments so that you can provide that feedback. Okay. Don't be shy. I see a couple of you hanging back, but no reason to. I'll let it stay open for just another maybe 10, 15 seconds and then we'll be underway. Okay, Dr. Muggleston, thank you so much. Back to you, sir. Perfect. So closing up, kind of getting to the end here, guys. Um, you know, the, probably the most important thing directly for you right out the gate, especially with patient care, is to start building your confidence. Um, 
you know, you really want to make an effort to make sure patients are comfortable and feel that you are the provider that can and that can handle their oral health and make them better. You're, you're, you're there to serve them in general, and, and building that trust with them will allow them to have confidence in you as well. Um, things to do this, though, is, you know, know your patient's names, dress appropriately, come in and, and be, be the person that, you know, you would want to see as a professional to take care of your, um, your oral health as well. Um, ask them questions. Most importantly, listen to them. Sometimes they just want a shoulder to cry on. And I know that you guys have seen those patients, right? They just talk your ear off and it will happen. But sometimes just giving them that extra five minutes could be the difference between them referring you to 10 patients. And so it builds exponentially. Um, and get to know them per personally. One thing we do in our office that's great, we actually have a tab where we take that, that the patients don't ever see that's not part of their records but is attached to their, their file. And it allows us to write patient notes about them personally. We get to know them, who, you know, how many kids they have, what they do for a living, uh, where they live, how they heard about our practice, and maybe what their hobbies are. That way we can, in conversation, things we learn, we add in there. My hygienist added in, in there, my assistants do. So when I go back, when I see them six months later, I can ask them about, hey, you know, how was that trip to Disney World, guys? How was it? Was it great? I'm like, oh, man, my dentist, like, listened to me. Like, they remembered that. That's crazy. They, well, you know, it's, it's not that I remembered, per se. It's that I took notes, and I was in, interested, and I, I engaged them, and I, I, I made a focus to remind myself about what was going on in their life, and it makes a huge wow factor for the patient. Uh, we also, you know, like to introduce ourselves to the patients up front. Every new patient that comes in is introduced by the doctor. The doctor goes and gets them and brings them into the consult room, not an assistant. Brings them into a consult room and gets to know them for five minutes before we ever start extra. And I'm telling you, by doing things a little more intentionally like that, patients love it and they want to, to be in your practice and they want to tell people about you. And it makes me, in general, feel better about the dentistry I'm uh, about to provide. Um, over time, this is a picture on the left of a case that I more recently did about a year ago or so. Um, but over time, you know, you're gonna build, you're gonna build your success. You're gonna build your clinical confidence. Um, every day, you want to pursue better and better uh, clinical ability and 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 treatment presentation confidence with your patient. Um, you know, this is not a straightforward bang out case per se. Um, you know, there's a lot of things to consider, you know, with, you know, number 31 uh, right there. Do I, do I crown lengthen the mesial? Do I, do I do these things um, that might give me a better outcome or do I just leave my crown prep there? Uh, this implant, do I do an immediate implant or do I not? Do I let it heal first? Um, you know, this is, these are all things that we got to decide on. You may not know the answers right now, but as you continue to get success in cases that you're comfortable with, it will build your confidence. And slowly you'll get better and better and better. Um, have technology that will facilitate that clinical excellence. Uh, make sure that, you know, you have modern equipment. You can see your x-rays, physically see what, where the carriers is at, not have to look up in the sky at a light to try and see through these old x-rays that you can't understand what is going on. Um, utilize technology that's there and make it part of your practice. Um, you want to adopt, you know, you want to have patients adopting your treatment plan. You want them to get case acceptance for you. See, right now you guys are in school, and the thing about being in school is they have no other choice. They don't. Typically, they're there because you are the last resort. There's nowhere else for them to go. They don't have either insurance or they can't afford a private practice. And so now they're coming to the dental school. And so whatever you tell them, they're cool with. But when you get out, it is not that way. And now patients have choices. And if they don't like you or the treatment plan that you're planning or it just seems like it doesn't fit to them, they'll leave. So really, it comes down to how efficient are you at getting trust with your patients to where they feel you're the one that should be doing the work and they agree with your plan and they're educated on why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and lastly, make sure that you leverage your team. Your team 
can help you for days. Use your assistants. Utilize every aspect of them. Let them tell you when your preps aren't good. That's okay. You know, a lot of people get nervous when I say that. But before, when I prep a, a serif crown, I always ask my assistant, hey, what do you think of this prep? Is it good? Should I do something different? And they'll give me feedback that allows me, and I let them sit right in front of the patient. And when they give me the feedback, oh, yeah, doctor, you know, you, you, know, you want to reduce a little bit more occlusally and, and touch up this lingual uh, margin. It's a little bit sharp. Great. And I turn to the patient and I go, isn't it amazing having a person that's going to actually fabricate and design your crown right in the op operatory with me to tell me how to make you the perfect crown? Man, Krista's great at her job. So when I step out, do you think they're really nervous that Krista's the one that's going to design and mill her crown? No. They know that I trust her. They should trust her. So these are things that are really, really valuable. Um, and be sure to course correct, guys. Things are going to go wrong. Um, and, and when they do, it's okay. Or maybe you're, you're, you, you tr bit off more than you can chew and you need to call an oral surgeon in because you, you can't get something that you thought you could. Or, um, you know, it's, that's okay. And just be sure that you handle it appropriately with the patient and, and, and re uh, correct it next time. So in summary, position yourself for success, guys, early. Be intentional. Think about what your long-term plans are. Um, now's the time. Uh, dental school is a stepping stone. Get ready to move forward and, 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 and start your career. Find the right mentor. Be, be sure, and, and I would encourage you multiple mentors. I have six, and they're all for different aspects. Some are clinicians, some are business people, um, and, and, it, and it's different for what I use each one for but they help really align my, my ideas and, and my thought process and help me set my goals and my action plans correctly. Uh, leadership um, and action and words. You both have to, you have to do what you say and you have to also support those that are around you. Uh, build your confidence. Um, it comes with, yes, it comes with repet repetition, but also correcting when things are wrong and the things that will teach you the most are the ones that go wrong. Um, and lastly, evaluate your progress and plan for how you're going to move forward. You know, never stop growing. Don't, don't get complacent. One of the biggest mistakes I see um, with a lot of business owners is they get complacent with the way they run their business or how much the office is actually project, projecting to do or the type of dentistry they do, and they stop progressing and they stop growing, and that's when they start to lose their drive. So you know, keep, always keep that core um, innate with you. Um, thanks, guys. You know, I really appreciate it. Um, I appreciate the time. It was, it was a lot of fun. And I, and I hope that you guys got something out of this. Um, here are my four top choices of books that I recommend to every one of my partners. I asked them to read these and, and I, asked, I asked questions to make sure they did um, about these topics. And it really does align us well because I know that now when we're communicating, there's concepts there that we both know and understand, and I can relate back to that. So thank you guys. Um, and, and again, I know there's questions, so please reach out. Rich is going to take it from here and get some questions, and then it's a, I'm here to stay as long as you guys want. Oh, that's really nice and generous of you. Thank you, Dr. Muggleston. We really appreciate it. An informative discussion for all of us. Uh, I learned some things along the way that we hadn't covered previously, too. Uh, let's start with this this question that just came in a moment ago. How long in your when your time as an associate were you in that role before you were in the transition from associate dentist to owner dentist? And can you outline some of that process? Yeah, um, I, I had talked to Pacific Dental since I was a second year dental student, so I knew a lot about them. And by the time I was a fourth year, they knew who I was pretty well. We had had multiple conversations over the three year period. Um, I went in with the intention. I said, you know, I really want to be an owner in, in, in a year or less, and, and that's my goal, and I want to know the things that I need to do to get there, and they kind of aligned that. They said, here's the, here's the process and what expectations we want to see to make sure that you're a great partner for us, too, and that we align well, and it was about five months out of school that they started to have the conversations uh, about ownership, and it was, I believe, 11 months out of school that we opened up the first practice together um, as a group. 
And what tools did you find most useful for building your leadership skills as a new dentist and an owner dentist? Uh, mentors and communication. So mentors for sure. I, I, I picked people that are, were already doing where I wanted my career to go. So I, I sought out a couple people that were very successful within um, the organi organization and outside. And I used a lot of the tools that they had recommended for me to focus on. Uh, communication, though, was key. Originally, I came out, I'll be honest, with a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, you know, a little bit of an ego, and I, I felt like I knew what I was doing, and I was very confident. And my assistants literally taught me more than I learned in my last two years of dental school, hands down. And I learned those things in about three to four months. And I realized that, yes, dental school is extremely crucial for the information, but real-world practice and having open communication with great people who do it every day really can allow for trust to be built and learning to happen. And I'll be honest, unless you got, unless you feel, if you don't feel uncomfortable, you're not learning. Learning is a process where you have to feel uncomfortable and that's when it's happening the best. So when I felt most uncomfortable, I'd lean on those assistants and staff members to help me through it. And I learned more that way. All right, let's, uh, let's back up in your timeline just a little bit. We have a question that's, how did you sell yourself as a new graduate when you were the, the, the aspiring dentist across the chair from the practice owner? How did you engage and, and kind of convey your, that you were the right choice for their open position, Dr. Muggleson? Um, I'm a pretty driven guy. And I'm very, very, I, I carry a lot of energy, I'm kind of a fireball when I'm in the office. And I, <laughs> I, I, I kind of come in like a whirlwind at times. And I, so I wanted to exude my passion. I wanted them to see how much I, I, I love dentistry and I want to be a, a business owner and how hungry I was and my aspirations. But I also made sure that they knew I was vulnerable to coaching, that I, I really wanted to be open to learning things that I knew I didn't know everything. And um, so that really kind of set it apart, I believe, for them. From what I understand, the biggest thing for them was persistence. Uh, they had said, you know, you were there second year, third year, fourth year. Every time you came in, you came up, shook our hand, reminded us who you were, talked about your aspirations and how you wanted to be a part of this. And then Oak constantly called and, and texted, you know, every four months or so to, to keep them reminded that, hey, I'm still, I, I, I'm in the fishbowl, you know, don't forget me. Um, so I, that was kind of my approach. Excellent. Excellent. Um, another question for, with regard to meetings and things like the Hinman that's coming up, the ADA and various dental meetings, organized uh, dentistry across the country. Is that an option that you see for a student to consider attending in pursuit of a mentor? Is that the type of environment that you find conducive to, to identifying a mentor? Where's that ideal location? And is it in one of those larger association meetings? You can. Um, I mean, I've, I've met some great people going attending some major meetings, CERC 30, um, ASDA. I mean, I've met some great people that I met at some of these ADA. But um, I honestly found the best value I got as far as my return on investment for spending time trying to find a mentor and actually getting somebody that's really valuable was really just networking outside of, not only outside of my organization, but outside of my practice, and some internal, some external, trying to get to know what people were doing, what their practice models were. And when I found somebody that was a speaker or somebody that I really thought that they aligned with my, my philosophy, I started to engage in conversation. And I think that's the key. The other thing you want to keep in mind is there are people that will tell you a lot about themselves and it doesn't quite relate to really how their business and their practice runs. So you have to be very careful about that. So I, when it was somebody I really felt valuable, I wanted to go to their practice. I wanted to see how they engaged other people. I wanted to see if they were the real deal from what I was hearing. And uh, at times they were better than I thought. And I was more impressed and I knew that that's somebody I want to be involved with. And other times I became, I realized that maybe it wasn't the right fit. They're great meetings. I think you can get a lot out of them though. And you can find people there. Um, but I think networking in general, and, and multiple events, you know, your, 
your your um, so, you know your dental societies and those things. A lot of them have mentorship programs, and the people that choose to sign up as mentors typically really love being a mentor. Great advice for sure. Great advice for sure. When you're stuck with a problem now, I mean, you're not in your 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 initial entry into the profession at this point, Dr. Muggleston, who do you turn to for a clinical, uh, a clinical question that you have yourself as a, as a guy who with a lot of chair-side experience at this point? There's still some things that make you um, ask for some feedback. Where do you go for that? Uh, my partners. Um, I do have a couple mentors that are dentists that are great and have been practicing 20, 25 years, and I ask them as well. But um, it depends on the situation. If it's an implant, I go to my mentor that knows more about implants and has had the experience, so I go to that person. Um, but if it's day-to-day -day stuff, uh, ironically, this happened last week, uh, there was a case that I was very, very confused about. Very, very confused. Uh, the patient had a huge infection on, uh, on a periapical of number seven that was very, very obvious. And, um, but the patient let us know that they had come back from the hospital and were recommended to come see us after three days on IV antibiotics. And the patient's whole left side and orbit and zygoma, every, every aspect of the whole left side of the face was completely swollen, almost double to triple the size. Wow. But the infection was on the other side and it was very confusing to me. So I reached out to uh, my team members and my other partners, and ironically, it wasn't even a partner. It was an associate that just came on board that really nailed the, the right diagnosis, and we got our endodontist involved, and the endodontist, you know, agreed with the diagnosis. I agreed. I just, you know, it was a little outside the box for, for all of us, and she came up with a great plan, and we went that direction. The patient's been doing great since. So it's, it, you know, sometimes it's just, it, it can be anyone that you just feel real comfortable with talking to. Fantastic. I mean, it talks a lot about dentistry as a peer to peer conversation to arrive at a, at a sound diagnosis and treatment plan. That's one of my favorite things about the profession is how open you all are with your experience and your insight to be able to share with one another to resolve an issue instead of, you know, hiding it like it's your technique that you're not going to pass along. It's the exact opposite. It's one of my favorite things about this profession. Sure. Yeah, me too. Um, one of the things in that same spirit, you were talking um, about things to build trust with the patients, and that I know for you starts right at their first time visiting the practice. What are the steps that you take when they come in the door and you're thinking about that first consult and sitting down with them? What steps do you take right at that first, that first visit to build that trust in the patient for the first time? Uh, so for us, it starts before that. So the one thing, the one word of advice that 90% of offices, it's this is a random, random percentage, but um, that I think that most offices miss 100% is the phone call, the initial phone call. That's when it starts. The first time they call your office and sign up for a new patient exam, the way you answer the phone and the way you engage a patient right then and there will say a lot about your office. So when a patient calls in, we typically are very excited to Hear, you know, hear them call, hey, you know, great to hear from you. How did you hear about our office? You know, and we start to engage open-ended questions where we hear how they heard about us, what insurance they use, what they do for a living, those kind of things, get their information down, and then we utilize the doctor's name. Okay, I'm setting you up with Dr. Cody Muggleston. You're going to see Dr. Muggleston um, on the day you come in, and he's going to be the one to introduce himself to you first, and he's going to take you back and do a consultation first to get to know you before we do any extras. So they frame the appointment start to finish. So patients know that they're expecting to come in and see me first. And they also add, hey, and we're gonna block off two hours of time for you. And that's unorthodox in most practices, but we're very particular about our new patients. So we wanna block off two hours of time because we wanna to get to know you, we want your x-rays, we wanna do your exam, and we wanna get everything coordinated with your insurance. And if you decide you want to do any treatment you'll have an entire hour to hour and a half to be able to do anything you want to if you decide, because we know a lot of our patients are very busy people. If you decide you don't want to, that's okay. You can reschedule, but we block it off just for you. So they feel like it's a personal service. And then, um, and then all we have to do is make sure we execute the same way we just promised. And if we do that well, then we win. Fantastic. When you think about the your 
associates and as you're thinking about them migrating up that same progression and being interested in practice ownership, what are the qualifications you're looking for in those in those individuals that that indicate an interest or an aptitude in practice ownership? How do you evaluate that process? Okay. Um, well, I'll be I'll be very blunt. Um, first of all, I want to make sure that that doctor likes to do dentistry and can produce it, right? I mean, there's a lot of guys that come out and they talk a big game and they have a passion for dentistry, but when it comes to doing the work, they can't hack it. Um, and maybe not right away, you know, maybe they have to be coached and trained, but until you can show competency in doing these things at a, at a, at a rate that is different than what you know from school, you know, you got to be able to see 12 to 25 patients. It just depends on your practice philosophy. I like 12. I think 12 patients a day is perfect. Um, but there's doctors that like to see 15, 18. You have to be able to handle more than one patient in the morning and more than one patient in the afternoon like school. You have to be able to do these things to be successful. And then you need to make sure that, right, that my, the doctor is getting case acceptance. If people are meeting them and not coming back and they're not retaining patients, that's not somebody I'm looking to partner with. So numbers speak for themselves. And if you look at numbers of, you know, we, we track metrics on how many patients actually complete their treatment. And if you see that percentage is 5%, well, I'm not looking for 5% of the patients to get treated. I'm looking for somebody who can treat just about everyone and walking in the door. Um, no, that, uh, obviously that's not feasible. People will leave or maybe they won't feel comfortable or maybe they didn't connect with you well enough or maybe they just they can't afford it. But you, I really need somebody who can um, get dentistry done and do it at a, at a, at a great level. Uh, you want to make sure they're a leader. Um, that they can lead people, that people want to be with them. One thing that I told my most recent associate, um, I told my associate, I asked him the question, a lot of times when I open a new practice with one of my current associates, I allow them to take their, their assistant that was with them and anyone who really wants to help them open up their practice. I don't hold them back. I don't, I don't make them stay with me. I, if they really love working with them, I want them to have that experience. So I ask them, what is it, if you, if we announce to the team tomorrow you're opening a practice, who will leave my office for you? And it's a very interesting thing. You get different answers. And if they can't give me an answer, they're not ready. Until they're creating growth of the people around them to where they have such loyalty that they would rather be with them, then, then they're not ready. Um, and my most recent one, I, I asked him the question, he hammered off three people in like 30 seconds and goes, all three of them would leave me for you. I leave you for <laughs> me. And I go, you're absolutely right. You are ready. And I believe that they will too. And when we finally announce the office opening, I guarantee you they will want to go work with them. It's not because they don't like me. They just built such great trust with him that it, it trumps mine. And that's okay. That's great. That means the kids, you know, the guy's ready to go. That's really outstanding. It's like the Jerry Maguire approach. Yep. Help me help you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, how often do you connect with your, your mentors and your mentees? I think our last question right here at the moment, it seems. A couple times a year. Um, my mentees, daily. That's different. I have, a, I have th uh, threads on, on, a, on my Facebook chat and all this different stuff. Uh, we have an app that we use. Uh, that all of my doctors are connected. And so all of my doctors literally are able to um, post cases, talk about problems. Hey, I've got this issue. Hey, I have a patient complaint. Um, what do I do here? Or can somebody come help me? Somebody's, you know, if one of the doctors are slower, they can move some patients and get over there. So, you know, we try and do that with each other on the regular. Typically, I get three or four of those a day, and there's usually four responses before I ever get to it because somebody's answering the question already. So it's a good open dialogue that happens. Uh, but my, men my mentors, uh, you know, me as the mentee, uh, it's mostly when I have big, big questions or I have big changes in my career path that I need some guidance on. All right, just a couple more. If uh, Dr. Muggleson, you have the, the time to answer a few that are coming in at this point? I do. I saw one that was about a DSO. Yeah, that there's a question about why, uh, why did you opt to pursue a, a career working in a dental supported office rather than potentially opening your own private practice? It's a question that might be appropriate for several folks who are listening in right now. 
Sure. Um, the answer is different for every person. For me, it was very clear and obvious that my career path could slingshot much better with the support of the DSO. Dental supported office or organization is one that, uh, I'll be honest with you, what it's typically termed is corporate dentistry, okay? And so, it, you, I, I, like I said, there are three in particular that I do not consider corporate at all. In fact, they're very much the opposite. And ours, we, we actually look at it as private practice plus, where I run my practice. However, um, I run my practice the way I want, but they support me in ways in, in, in business and marketing, payroll, HR, IT, um, all of these different aspects that I don't want to deal with. The DSO, as my partner, supports those things in the business so I can go and do what I do best, which is dentistry and coaching. Uh, think about chefs, right? You think about chefs, all about, you know, uh, Guy Fieri, right? He has all these restaurants. Do you think Guy Fieri runs every one of his businesses? No, he does not. What these great chefs do is they open up a restaurant under their concept, and they have business people that help them run the business and run the financial aspects of how to manage that business. They're there to provide the food and the experience. So that's the same idea, and that's what I got from Pacific Dental. So it allows me to be better at what I'm good at and focus on those things while someone who's much better at the other things can handle that, and our business runs more efficiently. I've made more money doing it that way, if, if, you know, if we can be honest. I've, I've been more financially successful because of it. I've had a lot less headaches because of it, and I feel more supported. I have a network of people that I can ask questions to that know the stuff that have been doing it 25, 30 years that I, I just don't have that experience. Really thorough answer. I appreciate that. Uh, let's switch gears and talk just from a, a clinical and training perspective. Uh, Mark is asking, do you place your own implants, restore them, or both? And as a kind of a follow-up to that, did you have, uh, how did you schedule your time off and handle reimbursement for that training? Is that from your own, from your own wherewithal, or is that supported in some fashion from your DSO as well? So, I do place my own implants. I do restore my own implants. I restore them with the CERC machine. Uh, typically, I do two, two stage. I'll place, wait three months, and then place the crown. Um, we can usually, I do in-house um, implant crowns with my CERC machine that look pristine. I mean, they're just beautiful. Patients love them. They're done in one visit in 40 minutes. Easy. Um, implants, uh, look at my Facebook. I have a six minute implant video of doing an implant in six minutes, start to finish, no time stop. Uh, it's very simple to do. So it's a procedure that I believe is everyone, every general dentist should know how to do it, especially in, within their comfort zone. Um, but it's simple to do. It's productive and it's life changing for patients. I do all on fours, over dentures, implant supported over dentures. Um, I do a lot of those on my own. But I also have a periodontist and an oral surgeon, as I alluded to. So there are cases that are above my scope. I've done a couple of sinus lifts. I'm not great at them yet. I'm still learning. So most of that stuff, I still refer to my periodontist, and he's guided me. I got to do my first sinus lift side by side with my periodontist. He did one on one side, showed it to me, taught me, and sat there while I learned to do the second one and did it on my own. I learned to place implants, both from my periodontist and my oral surgeon. I believe you really don't truly learn implants until you place them. Unless you do it physically, do it yourself, you're not going to learn. So I had them there to guide me and teach me the things that are necessary. Do you have, yeah, someone, on your, do you have someone on your wish list to, to see a course and, and to take their hands on or perhaps that's on your, you know, your aspirational list at this point in implant dentistry? Yeah, uh, Dr. Sauer within the PDS Institute runs the implant courses, and he runs a hands-on course that is awesome. And I've gotten feedback that he, he goes through everything, not only how to place and systems to use, but how to restore it. And yes, uh, did I have to pay for, do I have to pay for some of it myself? Um, yeah, there are situations where you do. If it's a certain course you want to take, some of them can be as high as ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. As far as my organization internally, no, I do not pay that. No, it's not, it's not that expensive. Typically, um, they'll give you very much reduced rates just for the, basically just for the part. Um, in addition, um, you know, I just asked my periodontist, my oral surgeon, I didn't pay for anything. You know, they just taught me because, you know, they work with me and they want me to grow. 
Excellent. Well, I think that uh, we're going to cut the questions here, Dr. Muggleston. I uh, really appreciate how giving you been of your time and, and handling all these questions from the field. Sounds like from all the comments that I'm seeing in the thread that it's been very valuable for our attendees and they're very complimentary of your, your, your insight and some of the things that you've shared with them. It seems like they've learned a lot. And I uh, want to thank you on their behalf for all the, the insight this evening. Really appreciate it. No problem. Absolutely. My pleasure. All right. Well, then, on behalf of all of us here, I wanted to thank you and everyone from the next EDS wanted to mention our appreciation as well. Dr. Muggleston, a job very well done. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Pacific Dental Services, for making you and your time available to us and, and for really putting together a, a top-notch program for our folks tonight. And so I just want to say thank you for everybody. And if you wouldn't mind, before you leave, Dr. Muggleston did share his contact information right on screen for you right now if you have a follow-up. and want to pose that his way. Uh, he's certainly got a wealth of information to pass along if you take the time. And uh, if you would also, before you leave, just share your thoughts in our post-event survey. That would be very helpful for our group in continuing to develop these programs on your behalf. So thank you, everyone. Appreciate no your problem. time. And no problem. And if anybody, if anybody wants to reach out to me via um, email and you want to have a little bit more in-depth conversation, um, please, uh, leave your cell phone number and just, you know, let me know that, hey, you want to have a little bit longer conversation, what the topic is. I'm, I'm more than happy to spend the time and, and hopefully be able to get through and help you out to kind of create some clarity for, for whatever it is that you need. Thank you so much, Dr. Mogelston. Everyone, thank you for your evening and have a great time tonight. Bye-bye now. Thank you very much.